you know, every day is a little bit different, but I'm not in one place all day long. I'm kind of hopping between the hospital and the clinic. So, you know, for instance, today I was in the morning. Uh, I had clinic here from nine to 12 in the office where I was seeing my outpatient chronic kidney disease clinic patients. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to eShadowing. We are back better than ever. Um, as we get started here, hello, Agatha. Hello, Lauren, Robert, Gabrielle, Derek. Hello, hello. Derek Larson, that's our guest. Hello, raise your hand. Thank you. I'm like reading names. I'm like, hey, that's who. Uh, that's who's supposed to be on. Let me and promote you to panelist. Rockin' and a rolling. As we get started here, uh, let me know where you are watching from. Where, uh, where you are at in the process of being a pre-med. And more specifically for our guests today, potentially uh, what you're looking forward to, learn about some nephrology and hypertension. How you doing there, Dr. Larson? Oh, you're muted there. How's it going, Dr. Gray? Good to see you. Hello. It's great to see you as well. Thanks for taking some time to hang out with us and uh, talk some talk some kidneys. Absolutely. Good to see you again. <laughs> yes. Um, so let's let's talk about the kidneys. Um, apparently, uh, an important part of our body. Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, well, how does one get uh, super interested in the nephrology world? Yes. So uh, certainly the uh, first and second most important organ in the body <laughs> are the kidneys. First uh, and second. Oh. Yeah, you know, and I really think it comes down to mentorship, um, you know, kind of finding a good mentor early on in the pre-med years and the residency years. For me, it was really the pathophysiology of the kidneys. Um, I love the science behind it. I love the physiology. Um, I love the continuity of care that you had with patients. You kind of see them lifelong. And I really love how every day is different. Um, we have acute kidney injury, dialysis, transplant, kidney stones, electrolyte disorders, glomerular disorders, inpatient, outpatient, home dialysis, a little bit of everything. So it's really cool science, really cool detective work. Um, every day is a little bit different. And I really like kind of the long-term care with patients. So it kind of had everything on my wish list. Nice. <laughs> the the <laughs> wish list going into med school going, what do I want my life to look like? Uh, and that's the fun part about medicine is, is you really get to craft whatever the, the that work life uh, looks like for you. Exactly. So, that's absolutely right. Kind of finding what works best for you. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth has an interesting question right off the bat. What's the difference between nephrology and urology? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and patients come to me all the time um, thinking that I'm a urologist. And so that's, that's <laughs> part of it as well. Um, I, I think the easiest way to answer that is think of urologists as the surgeons. A lot of times they're doing the surgeries, whether it's bladder surgery, kidney stone surgery, um, lithotripsy, um, whether it's you know nephrectomy for kidney cancer removal. They're really the surgeons working with their hands. Um, I tell patients that if I do a good job, they don't have to see their urologist as much. You know, If I prevent their kidney stones, the goal is that they don't have to go back uh, to the urologist to get more surgical intervention. So a lot of times they're the surgeons, you know, they're doing the prostatectomies, all the prostate surgeries, our jobs, you know, a little, a little bit higher up, right with the kidneys. So we're looking at um, preventing kidney disease, optimizing risk factors. So kidneys don't get worse, certainly dealing with transplant patients after transplant, not the ones actually doing the surgery. Um, and uh, acid-based disorders, electrolyte disorders, really everything else. So we're kind of the, the medical counterparts. So we work very closely with urologists, but we're just not the surgeons. Yeah. What is, what is the day-to-day -day, uh, life look like for you? Yeah, and I, I think that's, um, I, I, so as a private practice nephrologist, um, the thing I like about it is every day is a little bit different. Um, I'm in the clinic every day for half the day. Um, I'm rounding in the hospital every day for half the day. And then throughout the month, I have certain days kind of uh, scheduled for dialysis rounding, where I round on my inpatient dialysis patients uh, and outpatient dialysis patients. Um, I see my home dialysis patients, both peritoneal and home hemodialysis. I have a transplant clinic. I have a kidney stone clinic. 
I have a glomerular disease clinic where we see lupus patients and IgA nephropathy patients. So, you know, every day is a little bit different, but I'm not in one place all day long. I'm kind of hopping between the hospital and the clinic. So, you know, for instance, today I was in the morning. Uh, I had clinic here from nine to 12 in the office where I was seeing my outpatient chronic kidney disease clinic patients. And then I just actually got back from the hospital um, where I was rounding on kind of my inpatients in the ICU and kind of new consults. And uh, tomorrow I'm doing some dialysis rounding. So it's, you know, really every day is a little bit different. And, you know, you're kind of, uh, you know, kind of in, you know, more than one place at one time, so to speak. Yeah, that's uh, that's fascinating. And I think that that's a very interesting thing. I, I don't think enough people look as they're going through this process, look at who they are as a person and what their interests are and what motivates them and what keeps them happy. And they, they end up in a, a specialty and they're like, Oh wait, I have to, I have to be in the hospital all right. the time for this specialty. I, I don't get the option of being in a clinic. And I think I would like being in a clinic more. Yeah. Um, I, I think being so intentional about what it is you want from your life, as we were just talking about, um, is important. And, and it sounds like for you, a big part of that was that variety of not being stuck to one place and having the options to kind of be where you want to be and, and have the practice that you want. That's absolutely right. And I think it's really important as you go through the process to kind of find those um, doctors that you think you may want to be and follow them along, shadow them, ask questions. Um, these were a lot of things I really didn't do as a pre-med and a med student. You know, I kind of, I saw the specialty I wanted, but I didn't think much about the lifestyle. I didn't think much about kind of what the practice situation would be. Um, and I, I happened to find sort of what worked great for me sort of serendipitously um, by finding the kind of underlying topic and the lifestyle ended up being my kind of lifestyle where it's hustle and bustle running around a lot. Um, but I think that's that's really important um, because, you know, where you're practicing, how you're practicing, and then, you know, every practice looks different. There's all different types of nephrologists. And, you know, really in the slideshow I prepared, I kind of talk about some of the different ways you can kind of uh, go and specialize. And I think every field has that. So really finding yeah. what works best for you and not getting pigeonholed into anything. Love it. Let's take a look at that, that slide Perfect. deck. Sounds good. So um, I, I kind of presented like a little bit of a case as well. And I don't know if, if that works best yeah. for kind of how this works or not, or if there's people that want to kind of jump in, kind of in between things, or just kind of jump in at the end, it's totally up to you. Um, let's see here. All right, are you able to see the screen? I see it. Perfect. Sounds good. So, uh, and Dr. Gray, feel free to kind of jump in with uh, questions, or if anyone kind of comes up with comments throughout, I kind of have it sort of interactive, but I kind of, you know, I, I picked a little case and then afterwards wanted to talk just a little bit about the different roads you could take in nephrology, kind of what drew me to nephrology and just a few things as I was thinking about it. But what I love about the case is, um, although pre-meds may not have all of the underlying science and pathophysiology ironed out yet to kind of think through it, um, you know, I think the logistics and sort of the, the broad strokes of this case really kind of lends itself to the detective work that we do every day in nephrology. Yeah. So um, this is a, you know, and this is a, a real patient. Um, I'll start by saying that. And um, it was a 72 year old male who came to the ER with three weeks of fatigue, malaise and joint pain, had a rash on his lower legs and a seven pound weight loss over the last month. So you'll kind of see a lot of vague symptoms, um, nothing that has to do with kidneys, nothing that you would think consult mm -hmm. nephrology at this point in time, but sort of the undifferentiated patient that came to the ER with multiple complaints. He does have chronic kidney disease stage three, his creatinine was 1.4, had high cholesterol, had a big prostate, and had well-controlled hypertension. Um, but you'll notice his blood pressure was less than ideal 12 months ago, but we you know, did a medication adjustment as an outpatient, and that was now better. Past surgical history, he had appendix removed, gallbladder and bunionectomy, so kind of uh, simple surgical procedures, and no family history of chronic kidney disease. Had a couple cancers and heart disease and his mother and father, respectively, but really no family history of chronic kidney disease. Former smoker, uh, social alcohol use, married, he's retired, two children. And here's his medication list. Um, so really just to kind of orient, you know, the top, uh, you know, three medications or blood pressure medications, lisinopril, amlodipine, and hydrochlorothiazide, very typical three drug regimen for patients with, you know, typically with chronic kidney disease and high blood pressure, Lipitor, which is a cholesterol medication, 
hydralazine, which is another blood pressure and heart medication, vitamin D, and then tamsulosin is Flomax for enlarged prostate. His physical examination, um, blood pressure was a little bit high. Uh, he was noted to have an aphthous ulcer, which is kind of like, you know, also known as a canker ulcer on the base of his tongue. His heart was normal. His abdomen was soft. He had no swelling. His neurologic examination was normal, but there was this particular rash uh, that the ER doctor noted on his bilateral lower legs. So this is uh, not the actual patient, but this is sort of a um, kind of a rendering of what the rash would have looked like. And this is, you know, we kind of call it a petechial rash, really lots of small dots on the lower leg that, you know, was really new, um, that wasn't a chronic rash that he had for a very long time. And we kind of come to this question of really what to do next. You know, do we want further history? Do we want labs? Do we want imaging? And, and this is kind of the detective work that, you know, we, we don't know this is a nephrology case yet. Um, and the next slide kind of gives some basic labs. I think when anyone goes to the emergency room, when anyone sees a doctor, a lot of it comes down to history, physical exam, and basic labs. So I kind of wanted to give the case in the way that it normally would present with history, physical exam, and then some brief labs, um, and maybe some imaging after that. So we kind of have a patient now with some vague complaints, rash, some weight loss, um, and now coming in uh, to the emergency room due to these symptoms. So we get some initial labs, and this is a metabolic panel. So this is basically every patient that goes in the ER gets a metabolic panel and a CBC, especially when they're kind of in, indifferentiated like this with kind of some vague complaints where you're trying to kind of sort out what's what. Um, we found his creatinine, which is kind of the kind of live and die marker that we look at in nephrology to be 3.2. So over double his baseline of 1.4. But the remainder of his metabolic panel was pretty normal. Potassium, sodium, bicarbonate, liver function tests were all normal. His blood count showed his hemoglobin was a little low at 11.7, but had normal white blood cell count and normal platelets. Certainly anytime you see a petechial rash, you always think platelets, you think kind of blood disorders. We're seeing normal white blood cell and platelets. So as these kind of labs come back, we're sort of piecing things together. We know he has an acute kidney injury. We know he's a little anemic. We know his platelets are normal. And when we look at numbers in nephrology, the creatinine is important, but the, probably the most important thing, um, just as important, if not more important than the creatinine, is the urinalysis. And what we're seeing in this patient is he had protein, he had blood, negative for glucose, negative for leukocyte esterase. So it doesn't really look like a urinary tract infection, but certainly is a lot of blood and a lot of protein. And under the microscope, we saw 50 red blood cells, really no white cells. And he had a urine albumin of over a thousand milligrams per gram. So basically we're looking at a patient with acute kidney injury with sort of a vasculitic looking rash, blood and protein in his urine, which in the nephrology world, we call an active sediment, right? So that really helps us kind of piece together the differential diagnosis and a patient that has over a gram of urine albumin. So we kind of are getting a little more history and a little more information with these labs. And I, I kind of wanted to just break down acute kidney injury because this is really what kind of drew me to nephrology is this sort of detective workup where you know the patient has kidney failure, but you really don't know why that's the case. And I think I was really interested in data gathering. I was interested in sort of talking to patients, getting new information, collecting clues, and sort of putting together an assessment. And I think nephrology really allows you to do that. So this is kind of the, the breakdown for how we think of kidney injury. We think of before the kidney, the kidney itself, and after the kidney, also termed pre-renal, intrinsic, and post-renal. And I put some examples on there just that we sort of see in everyday life. And a lot of times from the history and physical exam, you can kind of pigeonhole or kind of, kind of tune these patients to kind of what you think they may have. So pre-renal or things like dehydration, right? They just ran a marathon. They had a vast viral gastroenteritis. They haven't been eating and drinking. They're septic and hypotensive in the ICU, heart failure, cirrhosis. These are things that don't cause dehydration, but with heart failure, you're causing decreased heart output, cardiac output. So the kidneys are sensing sort of this pre-renal or this decreased blood flow state. Mm. Diarrhea, liver failure, those are kind of the pre-renal. The intrinsic renal disease are the things that are kind of like your glomerular diseases, your autoimmune diseases, renal infarctions, interstitial nephritis, acute tubular necrosis. 
all of these big words, but all it really means is the kidney itself, something's going on where the kidney is the primary issue and not a secondary. I tell patients, a lot of times the kidneys are the innocent bystander. They're dehydrated, <laughs> there's blood loss, they're minding their own business, and then all of a sudden something happens. Intrinsic renal disease is the kidney is the one to blame. And then you have post-renal disease, and that's things like prostate uh, obstruction, we're from a large prostate. That's an example where the urologist would be involved. Cancer, not only from the prostate, but other parts of the body where it metastasizes to, you know, maybe um, the retroperitoneum or the kidney itself causing a blockage. We can see retroperitoneal fibrosis from previous radiation exposure, let's say, for instance. Um, so all of these conditions are things that are kind of going through my head. And a lot of times the history and physical exam can kind of point me in one direction or the other. So the investigation questions that I sort of ask when I was called, so I was called at this point in time when we have this active urine sediment and kidney failure, and things that I'm asking about are, well, what's the timing of all this? What medications are the patients on? What's their medical history? The review of systems is always very important. And I think as you go through pre-med and med school, especially the first couple of years, and you learn how to interview patients and get a history and physical, I think a lot of times it sounds you know, it, it sounds very monotonous and very repetitive. And why are we, you know, asking this patient who comes in with chest pain questions about diarrhea and rashes and all of these different things. And I think as you progress through med school, you kind of learn how important these things are because you learn to take a targeted review of systems and targeted history. And the reason is once you know kind of the differential of the things you're looking for, these things make a lot more sense. So it's important to kind of get in the habit of asking these history questions because it's really important, especially for patients like this. So I'm asking this patient, you know, do you have back pain? Do you have hyper, is there hypercalcemia on labs that may be a sign of something like multiple myeloma? You know, have they had weight loss? Um, have they been eating and drinking okay? Do they have vomiting? Do they have diarrhea? What's their blood pressure? Do they have a history of cardiac disease or liver disease? Do they drink alcohol? All of these questions are things that sort of kind of help going back to that last slide, kind of help differentiate, well, what type of acute kidney disease are we talking about? Do they have a prostate? Was the prostate taken out? Do they have a cancer history? Are they on medications that could contribute to interstitial nephritis or acute tubular necrosis? Are they taking NSAIDs? Do they have, you know, do they have blood loss or, you know, are they throwing up blood or bloody diarrhea? All of these things are really helpful when you kind of start teasing apart these, um, this history. Physical exam is also very important. And I think a lot of times the physical exam, especially going through med school, you learn normal, but sometimes it's more difficult to kind of define and determine abnormal. So the physical exam, when we look for kidney disease, we're looking at for things of volume contraction, signs of volume contraction, you know, decreased skin turgor, low blood pressure, dry mucous membranes, lack of edema, clear chest x-ray. Um, now with point of care ultrasound, we're looking for, you know, things like IVC compression and different things like that. So we have a lot of tools at our disposal to determine volume status. Some things that we don't see so often, but sometimes you can see on physical exam, maybe the patient has a blue toe. That could be a sign of cholesterol emboli and that can deposit in the kidney. Are they volume overloaded? You know, do they have a, a, an S3 heart sound that could be a, sound, a sign of heart failure? Do they have ascites or jaundice or um, ever signs of other signs of liver disease and portal hypertension, hepatorenal syndrome? These are all sort of little pieces to the puzzle that as nephrologists, we try to gain through history and physical to kind of help define this patient presentation. Next thing is imaging. So I asked for a renal ultrasound on this patient because again, pre-renal didn't seem really too common from the, or didn't seem too likely from the history and physical, but it was hard to kind of exclude a post-renal cause. And it's, it's always really embarrassing when you, when you don't uh, kind of um, diagnose a, a urinary obstruction with acute kidney injury. So it's easy to get a bedside renal ultrasound typically in the ER. And for this patient, there were no sign of hydronephrosis. The patient had normal kidneys and no post-void residual. So what this really means is the kidneys weren't backed up, they weren't ballooning, the patient was emptying their bladder okay. So we sort of excluded a post-renal cause. So the next part of the evaluation for me as a nephrologist is taking a look at the urine. 
So as a nephrologist, um, you know, everyone has a certain number of procedures that they perform. In private practice, the procedures are, are, are pretty minimal, actually. So in fellowship, we did renal biopsies, we did uh, uh, dialysis catheters. But in private practice, it really comes down to, um, you know, really urine microscopy um, and sometimes ultrasound being the procedures that we perform on an everyday basis. Urine microscopy and nephrology is sort of the poor man's kidney biopsy is what we call it. <laughs> Basically, it's, it's free, um, it's, it's, it's easy, um, and it gives us a ton of information. So we know that this patient had red cells in his urine. We know he had protein in his urine. So I wanted to take a look at his urine myself under the microscope to see if there were other signs that may steer me in one direction or another. So this picture shows the setup that we actually have at our local hospital. There's a centrifuge on the left where you actually spin down the urine. And the goal of that is really to produce a urine sediment. All of the cells after spinning in the centrifuge are sort of confined and concentrated at the bottom of the test tube. So when you resuspend that pellet or that urine sediment, you really get a good concentrated view at all of the cells in the urine that are abnormal or sometimes normal to kind of give you a clue. And then we look at that under the microscope. So for this patient, what we saw were two things. Uh, on the left, we saw something called red blood cell casts. And on the right, we saw something called acanthocytes. So the acanthocytes are actually dysmorphic or um, kind of abnormally shaped red blood cells. So normally, you know, kind of one way to think about that are sort of Mickey Mouse ears. You know, you have a really small cell that's squeezing through a basement membrane that's disrupted for one reason or another. And because of that, it kind of causes these blebs or these Mickey Mouse ears. And these acanthocytes that when we see on the urine, these acanthocytes, it's very, very um, a good predictor of glomerular disease. So I'm really thinking about intrinsic kidney disease, particularly a glomerular nephritis in this patient, given his systemic symptoms, his acute kidney injury, and now the presence of red blood cell casts and acanthocytes that we're seeing on the urine sediment review. So you'll notice, I mean, this was something that I was able to do with two hands, cost $0, for, you know, prevented a kidney biopsy at this point in time. And I really was able to come to a real, getting really close to kind of what the answer would be for this patient. The left, those red blood cell casts, just to let you know, Basically, when you see these urine casts, these are things that form in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct of the kidney. And it's from the precipitation of this special protein in the kidney tubules called TAM Horsfeld protein. And it's secreted by the renal tubule cells. Basically, this protein is kind of carrying along these red blood cells, which are not normally seen in the kidney tubules all the way to the urine. So you're seeing this concentrated array of cells inside this protein that's also very sensitive and specific for a kidney disease, particularly a glomerular disease. So seeing these two things together is almost a slam dunk for glomerular disease, but you'll notice there's many, many different types of glomerular diseases. So we need a little more information before we can start treatment and come and kind of come with a definitive diagnosis. So we have this patient with what we call nephritic presentation, and that's a patient with acute kidney injury, sort of bloody urine with acanthocytes, red blood cell casts, and we know that the blood in this patient is coming from the kidney. It's not coming from a kidney stone. It's not coming from the ureter or the bladder because we saw these acanthocytes. So there's a lot of really fancy tests up on the screen. And all I wanna kind of, you know, the take home for this is that there's a lot of other detective work that we can do as nephrologists with different serologic workups to help kind of, you know, we have this differential of a nephritic presentation, but what exactly is the cause? Because there's 10 or 15 or maybe 20 different causes of glomerular nephritis that could present like this. This testing kind of helps fine tune one versus the other. This is very high level stuff. This is something that you're not expected to know as a pre-med, but I think it's kind of cool to know that again, this detective work, these different tests kind of help fine tune and sort of refine our differential diagnosis. This is sort of, again, something not to memorize and it's, it's a lot of small prints, but all this shows is that you have that glomerular nephritis at the top, then you have all these different branching categories of different things it can be. And again, it's through all of those different blood tests that kind of help us define which one of those categories we're actually looking at. 
So back to our patient, these tests, again, some of them take a day, two days, three days to come back. So this is an evolutionary process. You know, we're not going to have all of this information back at once, but basically the notable serologic workup, the giveaway on this test was that, or the giveaway for this patient was that he had something called an MPO antibody that was elevated, a P anca that was positive, and an antihistone antibody that was elevated. Again, nothing that um, I expect anyone at this level to know, but I want to give you a little information about what this means and how it's really cool that we were able to use blood work to define this patient's glomerular disease. So ultimately, we needed to do a kidney biopsy as well, because a lot of these conditions require pretty serious medications, chemotherapy agents, things that we're prescribing as nephrologists that you really want to have a good, hang, you know, a good handle on what exactly is causing the condition before exposing the patient to all of these different chemotherapy agents. So we do something called a kidney biopsy. So in fellowship, I used to do these with an ultrasound and a biopsy needle. In private practice, a lot of times they're done by interventional radiology and they're CT-guided kidney biopsies. They have really fancy CT scans and fluoroscopy devices to get these kidney biopsies. So they'll get a small piece of kidney tissue that to the naked eye looks to be the size of a pencil tip. So like really the tip of the lead of a pencil is really the size that we're looking at. When you look at it under microscopy though, it will look like the picture on the right. I drew an arrow to the um, sort of that red circle and that's actually the glomerulus. So that's actually what a glomerulus looks like under magnification on a kidney biopsy. And you'll see it kind of looks like that, that piece of tissue is sort of uh, longitudinal. That's kind of that core kidney biopsy, again, about the size of a pencil tip that we magnified under a microscope and we're looking at those glomeruli. What you see on the bottom is the medulla uh, or the medulla, tomato, tomato, how you pronounce <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> I've heard it pronounced both ways. It seems to be sort of specific. It depends on where you trained in the country. Um, but the top, the glomeruli are in the cortex of the kidney and the, medu uh, the medulla or the medulla is kind of the inner part of the kidney. That's the more vascular part. And that's why you can see kind of a little more red kind of peeking through in the medulla. So those are kind of what we're looking at with the kidney biopsy that ultimately gets sent to a lab where they do lots of different fancy cross sections, immunofluorescence, electron microscopy, light microscopy to ultimately come to a diagnosis. To kind of skip ahead, when you look at that glomerulus and you sort of cross section it to really fine um, cross sections and then stain it with H&E staining in addition to all different types of stain, you come up with this picture of the glomerulus which gave us our diagnosis. So also as nephrologists, we have really close relationships with urology, as we already spoke about. We have close relationships with all different specialties because again, nephrology really works with all these other specialties, but especially pathology. So every single biopsy that we perform, I individually you know, review with the pathologist. Uh, we get pretty good as nephrologists at reading these as well, but it's really important because not only does the biopsy give us a, you know, a diagnosis, but it gives us a ton of other information as well. It lets us know how much you know, fibrosis and atrophy is in the kidney, how much scarring is in the kidney. Are there other things going on that maybe we didn't know about? What's the architecture look like? You know, do they have diabetes? Are we also seeing diabetic changes? So it gives us a ton of information and it's really important to kind of go through these cases with the pathologist for these reasons. So again, the diagnosis for this patient was a huge mouthful. It was something called posseimmune focal necrotizing glomerulonephritis with, and then there was a little small crescent that you, um, I don't know if my pointer is working, but kind of at the three to five o'clock, you'll kind of see that area that's a little more sort of congested. Um, that's sort of a crescent and that's sort of a sign of really severe kidney injury. And you'll see kind of the pink sort of at the nine o'clock. Those are actually the red cell casts that we're actually seeing in the kidney tubules. So at this point, we have a kidney biopsy diagnosis of a very severe condition that's kind of correlated by everything we saw on the history, on the physical exam, on the urine testing, on the serologic testing, and now the kidney biopsy. So what this patient had was a vasculitis, this ANCA-associated vasculitis, that in this patient's case was actually caused by a drug. 
For this patient, it was actually hydralazine, which was that blood pressure medication that was started by his primary doctor or increased about 12 months prior. So that's where the medical history, that's where the past medical history really comes into play. And why it's really important, because I remember as a medical student, like you're, you're taking these med look, medical histories and medications and allergies, and it seems so monotonous, but it's really important, especially with cases like this, to really uncover this patient's on hydralazine. It was started 12 months ago, or it was increased 12 months ago, and that's ultimately what caused this ANCA-associated vasculitis. What a vasculitis is, is really an inflammation of blood vessels that can prevent and present in blood vessels all over the body, causing many different systems, um, symptoms and many different organs and different organ involvement. So it can be everything from a rash to fatal multi-organ involvement with death. So it's something that's very, very serious, but has a very heterogeneous presentation, presents a lot of different ways. And in this patient, it presented sort of with this rash, with this weight loss, uh, with this ulcer in his mouth and with kidney injury. So the last slide on the physiology, and then I kind of want to talk about a little bit about nephrology in general, and certainly answer any questions about this case or anything else. But I thought this case was interesting because it really kind of takes through all the different steps that we think about in nephrology. So what we see with this ANCA vasculitis is this patient developed ANCA, which stands for anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic autoantibodies. So these antibodies that are circulating in the bloodstream that are attacking neutrophils and causing inflammation in the blood vessel wall from all the white blood cells that have been stimulated by this ANCA. So ultimately in this patient, it affected the kidneys and you see all of this glomerular inflammation on the left of your screen, both in pictorial form and on the kidney biopsy. It's all of that inflammation that caused the patient to have those red blood cells in the urine, that caused the patient to have the protein in the urine because we were sort of affecting the glomerular integrity, sort of that, that, that netting, that filter of the kidney was sort of disrupted, causing blood and protein to leak. And it all kind of fit once we had you know, the results of the urine and ultimately the kidney biopsy. So all of this was consistent with hydralazine-induced ANCA-associated vasculitis, the patient went, un, underwent therapy with steroids and a medication called rituximab. His hydralazine was stopped indefinitely and his creatinine improved. It didn't quite get back to his baseline, but it improved to probably 1.6, which was a victory for this patient. That antibody level that was super elevated, normalized, and looking at his urine later on, his urine sediment was no longer active. So we no longer saw these red cells and protein that was present during the patient's course and presentation. So why did I choose this case? Well, it illustrates the importance of a good history, like I mentioned. Um, it's important because ultimately we're diagnosing and we're treating a life-threatening disease. So this is a situation where really you're saving a life. And I think that's why a lot of us go into medicine. And this is sort of an example of how you really are changing people's lives. Um, and a lot, of a lot of times it's just through taking a good history. Um, it shows how nephrology is similar to detective work, where you have broad symptoms, a very large differential diagnosis, and a vague presentation, and really presents the tools that we use as nephrologists to accurately arrive at a diagnosis through urine testing, serologic workup, kidney biopsy, and a lot of times history and physical examination. So why I love nephrology, and we kind of alluded to this um, kind of earlier on, I love the continuity of care with patients. Um, I really think there's meaningful doctor-patient relationships. I have a lot of patients where I take care of the daughters and the mothers and the grandmothers, um, especially with genetic disorders such as polycystic kidney disease. I like that I'm seeing patients lifelong. So it's sort of similar to primary care in that setting. I mean, you're really dealing with a lot of different conditions, their blood pressure, their anemia, their bone metabolism issues, their kidney disease, their cholesterol issues. Um, I like that every day is different. The outpatient clinic, hospital, dialysis center, transplant clinic, home dialysis clinic. Again, every day is different seeing patients in different areas, different demographics, and ultimately with different disorders. I also like that there's a wide range of patient types. I could see a kidney disease patient with chronic kidney disease in the morning. Then I could get referred a patient for low sodium or high potassium. I could see a kidney stone patient. I could see a patient with metabolic acidosis. 
Um, I'm also a hypertension specialist. So I see a lot of patients with sort of refractory and secondary hypertension. Patient with cystic kidney diseases. Uh, we get a lot of referrals for protein and blood in the urine. Um, in the urine. So really it's intellectually stimulating, every day is different, and you're really drawing in a lot of different physiologic things that you learn in medical school, that you learn in your pre-med years. So it really goes back to all of that, and you're really using all of, you know, all of your brain every day. Um, and there's a lot of cool stuff, right? We have imaging, we have urine sediment, we have biopsy, kidney transplant, one of the most rewarding and exciting things, really giving patients you know, another life with kidney transplants and following them in their post-operative course, managing their immunosuppressive therapy. So these are things that are really important to me, meaningful for me. Um, and this is why I chose nephrology. And I think it's only getting more exciting as we're learning more and have more treatments for these chronic conditions. So what was my journey to a board certified nephrologist and hypertension specialist? Starts with four years of medical school and then three years of internal medicine residency. After that, I did a chief resident year, um, which was a full year in internal medicine after residency. That is something that certainly was optional, but I do think that was the one year I grew most um, as, as a physician, I think. Um, and then when I look back, I mean, that was the year where you're, you know, you're teaching residents, you're teaching medical students, you're really gaining that autonomy. So I think I grew a lot. And I think if you ever have the opportunity to do a chief residency year, I certainly recommend it for so many reasons. Um, and that chief residency has really followed me throughout my career. I feel like when you look at my resume or my CV and, you know, looking at jobs and looking and, you know, exploring the market, that's something that it always kind of comes back to. They're like, oh, you know, you were a chief resident. So I think if you have that opportunity, certainly something to explore, followed by two years of nephrology fellowship. And then as a private practice nephrologist, um, some nephrology programs are two years, some are three years really just depends on sort of the course that you want to take. If you want to be a researcher, if you want to do clinical trials, clinical nephrology, academics. Um, but this was sort of the route that I took. But there's many, many different routes that you can take to become a board certified nephrologist. Or when you are a board certified nephrologist, routes you can take. Um, you can subspecialize after nephrology. There are numerous transplant nephrology fellowships, where typically, which are typically one year, sometimes two years. You can do interventional nephrology. A lot of times these um, nephrologists are doing uh, fistulograms and angioplasties for dialysis accesses and putting tunnel dialysis catheters in. There's dual um, fellowships in nephrology and critical care medicine. Um, there were some nephrologists um, that graduated with me that went on to do a critical care fellowship because there's so much interplay between uh, nephrology and critical care medicine. A lot of overlap. There are certain um, residencies that have a glomerular diseases fellowship after nephrology fellowship. Um, and then there's certainly some integrated programs with nephrology and geriatric medicine and palliative medicine, which is also very important. The basic science route, the clinical researcher route, um, academic versus private, I always think is a big, um, you know, is a big sort of uh, decision, especially when you're graduating from an academic program. Um, it was a decision I had to make. Did I want to stay in academics? Did I want to go to private practice? Uh, for me, it really came down to you know, really wanting to see patients. Um, I love the teaching part. I love the uh, academics um, for, for that reason, but I wasn't much of a researcher. So I did a lot of research and fellowship, but I really wanted to take care of patients at the bedside. That's why I chose private. Academia is fantastic for nephrology, also great options. And I have some friends that went into industry as well, both pharmaceutical and different types of industry. Um, I have a friend that uh, works for CVS. I have friends that work for different bio, uh, biopharmaceutical companies and biochemical uh, companies and all different things in industry. So really a lot of different routes you can take. And you know, as Dr. Gray was saying, it's really just finding the quality of life, kind of where and how you wanna practice and really what you wanna be doing, what drives you, what, what, what you're interested in. Um, I think those are really the important things to kind of keep in mind and, you know, talk to people in the field that you want to go into, talk to academic nephrologists, talk to private nephrologists. If you want to go into whatever specialty you want to go in, whether it's general surgery or ENT or ophthalmology, talk to these doctors to really find out, you know, kind of what they kind of, you know, what their day-to-day -day looks like and, and see if it meshes to what you're sort of looking for. Um, yeah. 
I also have a bunch of side gigs as a nephrologist, and this is really my last slide, but some people say, well, what else do you do? Is there other stuff that interests you? And, and for me that there is. So there's a lot of other things you can do. So um, I'm the medical director of two dialysis centers. Um, dialysis is something that you know is also a, a life-saving modality um, and they require nephrologists to be medical directors. So that's a, that's a great sort of kind of branching between nephrology and sort of the business of medicine. That's a great opportunity that you have. Um, I do a lot of legal consulting and expert witness work um, on the on, you know on the legal defense side uh, for um, for lawyers as expert witnesses. Um, you can do insurance medical utilization review. Um, I have authored book chapters and review articles. Um, I do do some pharmaceutical consulting uh, with physician education. Um, I am the member of um, advisory board committees, both uh, for pharmaceutical agents and also for the local hospital and PT committee in different communities in my hospital, um, as well as doing resident education, both for the medical residents and the pharmacy residents that rotate through our hospital. So I think you know, don't, um, you know, don't feel like you're sort of, you know, stuck in one area, uh, you know, really find those things that interest you and kind of use all of your skills to, you know, kind of do the things that you enjoy. So with that, I know that was a ton of information. I, I really think it's, it, it's awesome, Dr. Gray, that you're putting these on and I have such great exposure to, uh, to pre-meds and med students. And so thank you for the work you're doing and inviting me. And yeah. I'm really happy to answer any questions or, uh, you know, take any comments. My job's easy. I just get the host of party. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so uh, let's see. Lynn has an interesting question about endocrinology. She's been uh, thinking about. They've been thinking about endocrinology. Any thoughts on how the two compare, or any interaction between nephrology and endocrinology? That's a great question. Tons of interaction, tons of interaction. I actually was just on the phone with an endocrinologist uh, for a diabetic patient that we were sort of collaborating care about 20 minutes before joining this call. So I think endocrine is very similar in a lot of ways. It's a lot of detective work. You're also seeing patients kind of long term. And there's a lot of interplay between nephrology and endocrinology, not only with diabetes, which is probably the bread and butter for both diabetic, you know, chronic kidney disease. That's the number one cause of chronic kidney disease. Also, a lot of what diabetes doctors and endocrinologists deal with. So we have a lot of, you know, patients where we're kind of, you know, collaborating back and forth. Um, also, patients that have parathyroid issues and undergo parathyroidectomy, particularly dialysis patients, we're kind of co-managing with endocrinologists. I would say endocrinology, cardiology, and, and you know, primary care are probably the three subspecialties that I kind of deal with the most on a day-to-day -day basis. I think there's a lot of interplay with endocrine and uh, nephrology. And I feel like a lot of patients that are or a lot of, um, you know, kind of pre-meds. And as you kind of go through, I feel like those are two things that kind of go hand in hand where you're using a lot of history, blood work um, to kind of come up with diagnoses and kind of follow patients long-term. So I, I do see the, the appeal to both of those fields. Yeah. Uh, Brian has a question about the, the, patient presentation, what yeah. would have happened if the patient stayed on the medication long-term and the rash that appeared, um, was that something there for a while and the patient just finally realized it or did that, did that kind of occur all at once? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the, the patient told me that the rash was there the last couple of weeks and kind of, you know, with, with vasculitis, you can get, you know, sort of these vasculitic looking rashes. Um, and that was sort of what we thought that rash ended up being was related to the vasculitis. It can kind of present any time um, during the presentation. Sometimes patients have no rash. So, it, you know, it's it's not really, a, it wasn't a slam dunk when we saw it, but when you have these kind of nonspecific vague complaints and you see this sort of vascular looking rash, a uh, vasculitis is certainly, um, you know, in the differential. Um, the patients that present with this um, hydralazine is one of the more common medications, and generally patients are on the medication for over a year. So a lot of times it's not a new medication, but they've been on it, and then, you know, for one reason or another, it kind of causes this problem. You know, presumably for this patient, if the medication wasn't stopped, um, the vasculitis, which at the time was kind of confined to the kidneys and, and maybe the skin, um, ultimately would have gotten worse and it kind of been would have been more widespread and certainly life-threatening. 
Um, a lot of times with these conditions, stopping the medication isn't enough by itself. They actually needed the you know strong steroids and also this rituximab, which is a chemotherapy uh, medication to kind of really kind of cool the jets of the immune system, so to speak. So you know I, I think not stopping the medication would have been um, would have been really bad for the patient. But even stopping it alone and not doing anything else also wouldn't have been a complete treatment. So you know really really important to kind of you know not get bogged down by you know, the histories and, and really try to take your time to tease apart things because these little details, you know, can really save lives. So yeah, it, it's it's a great question. Um, and, and certainly I think stopping the med and the the new treatments um, that we gave this patient were ultimately what was um, certainly organ saving and probably life saving as well. What is your specific interest? Where where did your specific interest in hypertension come from? So yeah, asks yeah. Lashana. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Hypertension, again, the bread and butter of nephrology. Um, I think really for hypertension, the secondary causes of hypertension are really what sort of interested me. So, you know, when you have hypertension, you have primary or a central, that's kind of or essential hypertension. That's kind of the bread and butter, you know, family history, you're over 60, a little overweight, you know, diabetes, have high blood pressure. The secondary causes are underlying things that contribute to hypertension. And that's kind of what sparked my interest. These are things like primary hyperaldosteronism or um, things like, you know, sleep apnea can cause high blood pressure. These are things like Little's disease and all of these kind of random genetic disorders that you, you know, feel chromocytoma and all of these things that you think about all the time that you don't see all of the time. Um, really, these secondary causes is what interested me into nephrology, uh, hypertension specifically. Um, and I think also it was because I love the detective work. You know, you see a patient with high blood pressure um, that's been sort of accelerated, low potassium level, you know, you kind of do a little more digging and find they have a, you know, a high aldosterone level and find that they have a, you know, an adrenal adenoma and find out that this adrenal adenoma is causing aldosterone to be produced. And through the blood work and through the hypertension, you diagnose this condition. So again, it kind of comes down to, you know, kind of the detective work that I loved. Um, but really, even if you, you know, don't see a lot of these secondary causes, Hypertension is the bread and butter for a lot of different specialties. And I think knowing how to treat and, you know, optimally treat and kind of, uh, you know, kind of take care of these patients is, is really important um, and has really kind of developed a niche for myself um, in nephrology. I get a lot of referrals for this due to this interest. So I think with any specialty, kind of finding that little, you know, niche, so to speak, is really important um, and can really sort of separate you from others in your field if you have an interest in something that may be, you know, something that other people don't have, other people don't have an interest in. Yeah. Uh, Sarah has a question. She's interested in the the legal side of things. What kind of legal cases would you consult on as a, a legal expert? Yeah, yeah. So um, I um, have you know, consulted on maybe five or six different cases in the past, um, particularly for uh, medical malpractice cases uh, for the defense side. Um, a lot of times it's really um, them coming to me uh, due to a, a nephrology malpractice case where the lawyer just kind of wants to show me, um, you know, wants to show you the uh, the case and the information and the medical records and just kind of, you know, kind of get your take on things. Um, I like it for a lot of reasons. I think it, um, I think it makes me a better physician to kind of see how others are practicing and what others are doing. Um, I think it makes uh, me a, a safer practicing physician as well, just to see what malpractice cases are going on in the community, how to uh, protect myself and protect my patients and ultimately protect other doctors. Um, so I love working for the defense side in that case to sort of, you know, you know, a lot of times you have, you know, you have patients and you have family members where, where maybe bad things happen, but, you know, a lot of times it wasn't at the fault of anyone. And I really like to tease those things out because I think it's important for, you know, for the litigants to really have a clear answer, but I think it's important to kind of protect our colleagues and protect ourselves as well, um, because, you know, it's it's just kind of a part of the reality when you're dealing with so many patients, you know, different things happen and whether it was fault to someone or not, um, I think it's important to kind of tease out what really happened. Um, and I think it keeps things fresh for me. Um, it keeps things interesting, uh, makes me a better doctor um, and sort of doing this defense work, you know, once it's kind of word of mouth, you know, after you've kind of reviewed a couple cases, I think the lawyers kind of talk and ask you, you know, if you want to review other cases and it's something you can kind of do at your, you know, at your leisure, at your own pace. Um, and I think it, it, it really, it's, um, it's interesting work. Um, and I, I certainly think it's something that makes me a better doctor by doing. Yeah. Um, 
Sophia has a question. What what would you do differently uh, on your journey to but but end up in the same place? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really really good question. Um, what would I do different? So I think you know a common question I get is would I do it again if I had the chance? I I would do it again. I would end up in the same specialty, which is really reassuring to me in this specialty <laughs> that you know doing it again. Um, what I think I would do is is sort of kind of a question that you asked earlier. Is you know I, I kind of jumped into it um, due to a very charismatic mentor I had. And I, you know, kind of going through residency, I said, I want to be just like that doctor. I love nephrology, but I didn't really know what the day-to-day -day was. So I think I would end up exactly how I was, but I would really want to know, okay, I'm enamored by nephrology. I think you're the greatest guy ever, but what do you really do day-to-day? -day? What's the outlook like? look like? What is the, you know, what's the, what's the home versus work life? What's the, you know, you know, what do the weekends look like? What does the call schedule look like? Like those type of things. Like sometimes I think, you know, you have to remember that you'll be doing this for the rest of your life, you know? So you're doing this, you know, I just turned 40, you know, I'll be doing this when I'm 50, God willing, when I'm 60, you know, and you have to think about, you know, are you able to do some of these things when you're that age? Would you pivot maybe and go into a different sort of subfield at that point? You know, can you be up all hours of the night, you know, for decades and decades? So these are just kind of things to think about. So I think what I would do is really continue with my mentor, do the research, um, but also talk to many other nephrologists, both in academics and community, and, and just kind of see, you know, is this the field for you based on those things outside of the interest alone with the subspecialty? Um, but that's a, that's a fantastic question, and, and that's kind of what I think I would do. Uh, Tesnim has a question about any specific age groups or ethnicities that you're seeing as a nephrologist? Yeah, that's that's a great question as well. So I think, you know, the bread and butter with nephrology is diabetes and high blood pressure. So as we get older, you know, these things continue to increase. Um, I think uh, the majority of my patients, you know, are, are probably age 50 and older. Um, many are 60 and older. Um, I had a 96 year old patient in the office today. So you know, I think kind of the elderly population is the bread and butter. Um, I think there is certainly um, an ethnic difference um, between, you know, many, many different conditions, particularly with African-Americans. Um, there's new genetic, um, you know, research that's coming out, particularly with something called an ApoL1 disease that's uh, present in African-Americans that causes accelerated chronic kidney disease, accelerated hypertension, uh, predisposition to a lot of glomerular diseases. So I think the genetics in nephrology is certainly getting greater as well. Um, unfortunately, I'm seeing younger and younger patients come to me with conditions that we normally saw with older patients, diabetic nephropathy, hypertensive nephropathy, and patients in their late 30s, early 40s, you know, obesity epidemic, all of these things that I think are contributing and people are kind of getting more severe disease earlier on in life. So I think that's something that um, and we're seeing really in all subspecialties, but I think as a whole, you know, we're, we're starting to see younger patients, um, but, um, you know, a lot of times that bread and butter is is, is really the, the older patients that we're seeing historically. Yeah. Is that shift to a younger generation and more severe disease? Is that worldwide? Is that a U.S. specific thing? Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's that's a um, that's an interesting. Um, I, it's definitely U.S. Uh, definitely U.S. for sure. Um, I do think worldwide to some extent. Um, I mean, if you look at you know even CDC gate data where they sort of extrapolate the incidence and prevalence of chronic kidney disease sort of out through 2030. I mean, this line continues to be sort of a linear progression um, with the increase of diabetes and hypertension. So I think. It's um, to a lesser extent worldwide, but I, I do think uh, the U.S. is sort of leading the way um, with the metabolic syndrome and, you know, obesity epidemic and all of that. Yeah. If you had your way here, here's a, a personal <laughs> policy yeah. question. If yeah. you had your way, would would things like soda and, and stuff like that, would that be bans, severely taxed? Like, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I love I love that these things are, are reaching the media, you know, and mm -hmm. are kind of causing people to kind of think about them. I, I think it's tough because I think it's so much more ingrained in our culture besides just soda. I think we're sort of putting a Band-Aid on a bigger problem. So I, yeah. I don't have like a better solution. I like the idea of making people think about the things that they're ingesting and thinking about long-term consequences. 
But I think, you know, there, there are so many things, you know, I, I see so many patients that it's, you know, it, it's calories and fast food. And even without the soda, there's so many other issues. And um, so I, I think we need kind of a, you know, kind of a reboot as a whole, um, unfortunately. And I think it goes way beyond that. But um, but we're, we're certainly seeing it um, in private practice. And it, it's sad. And it's, you know, you, you kind of feel helpless in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just just thinking about my own upbringing, we yeah. had soda in the house and juice in the house and everything in the house. And uh, and, and now with two kids of my own, I'm like, no apple juice in the house, no orange juice in the house, no sodas <laughs> yeah. in the house. Like, we, I still allow them to have some apple juice. Like if we're celebrating or uh, my daughter gets like Chipotle once a week and she gets the apple juice that comes with it. Oh, so, yeah, sure. yeah. But but yeah, it's it's crazy. And, and I, I don't I don't know if enough people are educated well enough and have the resources to to stay away from that kind of stuff. I don't know. I, I, you're right. You're right. And I think a lot of it's the resources. I mean, so I have a lot of satellite clinics in lower income areas uh, where I currently practice. And, you know, I mean, there's areas where, you know, there's food deserts, right? And they can't get fresh foods and produce. And now with, you know, with inflation and everything else. And I mean, you know, it's, it's healthy food is more expensive. Um, yeah. And when you're, when you're just trying to put something on the table and pay for your, you know, they're paying, they're on 12 different medications, they're paying for their insulin, you know, they're paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars. You know, it comes down to what's obtainable. Um, I mean, so it's so many different factors. Uh, but you're right; I was raised the same way as you, and I also have two kids, and and, and battling those same things. And I think it just really needs a whole reboot. Yeah, um, I wish I had the answer though. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, uh, Michael here is asking one of my favorite questions: uh, Any advances in procedures or technologies that are coming down, uh, coming down the pike for you? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, I, I think the big thing with with, with kidneys is sort of, you know, well, with, with transplants, certainly the mm -hmm. um, demand certainly outweighs the supply. So I think when we look at um, artificial kidneys and um, basically, you know, kind of growing kidneys in a lab and being able to template those through, you know, gene modification and, and, and sort of, and, and sort of create more of a supply for kidney transplants. I, I think that's going to be, you know, that's a big thing that they're kind of working on now. Um, I think things as far as dialysis, you know, there's always been this, you know, this wearable artificial kidney and, and things where you sort of, you know, aren't tied to a chair for three and a half and four hours, three days a week. Um, and, and certainly, you know, I think in the, you know, in the, in the sooner advance, you know, we have medications now, the big thing in nephrology over the last year or two years have been these SGLT2 inhibitors. I mean, we're looking at medications now that can slow the progression of chronic kidney disease, things that, you know, for many decades, we didn't have a new medication to treat. So really slowing down the disease, I think is really the, the closest obtainable things. We have a lot more medications available now to do that than we had even 10 years ago. And I think, you know, really looking down the road, it's really how do we help with the uh, supply demand mismatch for kidney transplantation? Yeah. Well, Dr. Derek Larson, thank you again for your time and your wisdom and uh, great case presentation. Hopefully get some more future nephrologists uh, in, in the, in the uh, pathway to, to uh, taking care of patients in the future. I sure hope so. Dr. Gray, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. And yeah. thanks for all the questions. Nice to uh, talk to you guys. Bye, everyone.